you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, be verses 28 and 29 is what we're going to look at to start with this morning. Before we get started, y'all know the routine, let's do our spiritual breathing. Let's let that junk we come in here with, let's just let it go, let's just turn it over to God this morning, give it to Him, and as you breathe back in, let the Holy Spirit fill that place in your heart. Let it go. Let go and let God. Y'all have heard that saying. Let go and let God. Let's let go of our junk this morning and let God have His way with us this morning. Let Him minister. Let, as I was praying this morning over this message, I said, God, don't let me just speak. But let us receive. You know, I, I don't want to speak into the air. I don't want to just speak, fill this room with a voice this morning. I want us to receive. And not just you, me as well. This message I'm going to preach this morning, I'm telling y'all, I was sitting there and me in tears because this message was so powerful to me. It's about being overwhelmed. And so many of us get overwhelmed in our lives. <clears throat> I find myself overwhelmed. I got, I got a mentor, a pastor that's up there sick in the hospital. I got a son that just had to leave service because of a chronic illness that he'll battle with the rest of his life. And it gets overwhelming. You know, it gets overwhelming at times. And then I think about some of y'all. I think about John, 43 years old, going through nursing school. You know, hasn't been in school for years, going through this nursing school. I know it's got to be overwhelming. Some of the other things some of y'all are going through, it has to be overwhelming. But God gives us promises. God gives us comfort in His Word. Let's look at that this morning. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. The Lord says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Father, thank you for those promises, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the comfort we find in your word. Father, I pray at this time that I can decrease, you'll increase. You'll speak through me, Lord. Hide me behind your cross. Father, let us to receive this morning what you have for us, Lord. Let us take it and apply it into our lives. Weld it to our hearts, Lord. Father, I pray again that you bind Satan and loose your spirit on this group of people whom you love. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Chippy the parakeet never saw it coming. One second he was peacefully perched in his cage. Next he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. The problems began when Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage. The phone rang and she turned to pick it up. She barely said hello when soup, Chippy got sucked in. The bird owner gasped, put down the phone, turned off the vacuum and opened the bag. There was Chippy, still alive but stunned. Since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him and raced to the bathroom, turned on the faucet, and held Chippy under the running water. Then, realizing that Chippy was soaked and shivering, she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She reached for the hairdryer and blasted the pet with hot air. <laughs> Poor Chippy never knew what hit him. A few days after the trauma, the reporter who had initially written about the event contacted Chippy's owner to see how the bird was recovering. Well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits and stares. It's hard not to see why. Sucked in, washed up, and blown over. That's enough to steal the song from the stoutest heart. You ever felt like Chippy? You ever felt like life just sucked you in and, and washed you up and just blowed you over? You know, I, I know, I, I was, I think we've all felt like that at one time or another. Yeah, life's got that effect on us sometimes. Life would just take us and Run us through the ringer, it seems like. And we just feel so overwhelmed with things. Things just, it just, everything becomes a burden to us. The slightest little things just add up and add up. And it's all just overwhelming. But God says, come to me, you who are heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. And there's some comfort in that, knowing that. But then there's a the question, well, God, you say that, but how do I apply that? What, what do I do with that? You, know, you say, God, come to me. They're heavy burden, and I'll give you rest. 
But we don't particularly know how to do that sometimes, do we? We don't know how to give it to God. We don't know where to find that refuge. You know, it sounds easy. It sounds easy enough. Well, here I am, God. Here it is. But all y'all know as well as I do that sometimes it don't seem like it works like that. We're trying to give it up, but we don't. Do you know God's Word contains answers for, just for every situation that we face in life? See, we, we, turn, we turn to all these places, and we turn to God. We'll turn to God, but we don't go to God's Word. God has given us His Word. He has given us... This is more than just some book, some ancient manuscripts. This is God's love letter to us. God has poured His heart out to us and given it to us so that we might have comfort, that we might be able to find solace in hard times. He has given us the Word of God, but this is the thing we neglect the most. <clears throat> the answers to all life's problems are right here in God's Word. And God says, come to me, you are a heavy burden, and I'll give you rest. Come look at my Word, seek my Word. My Word is full of promises. My word is full of my compassion and my love for you. If you'll come and you'll look in my word, I'll show you that there's better ways. I'll show you that there's hope. I'll show you that there's a God that loves you, that cares about you, that's compassionate for you. So let's take a look this morning and see what God's word says about being overwhelmed. Let's see what he says about being overwhelmed with life. Because God knows. He cares. He cares about each and every one of us. He knows when we're overwhelmed. And he don't want us to feel that way. He's gave us comfort. He's gave us solace right here in this Word. First thing, God has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. <clears throat> Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and hope. Do you know you're not an accident? Nobody here is an accident. Y'all ever heard a couple that had the third kid and say, yeah, this is our little accident here. <laughs> we didn't mean to have this one. Yeah, that was a little slip up there. Yeah. Well, maybe that was an accident. Yeah, I would never call my kid an accident in front of them as well. I'm going to tell y'all. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, you, and, and the parents didn't plan this child. And... and Things happen and the child come. And the parents did the right thing. Kept the child and raised it. <clears throat> and you might have thought that as an accident. Let me tell you, that child was not an accident to God. God knew. God knew when that child was going to be. God knew that child when it was still in the womb before it was ever formed in the womb. There's no accidents with God. None of us are an accident to God. <clears throat> Every one of us are important to God. Every one of us means something to God. He says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and hope. Let this thought set in. <clears throat> Let it sit in for a minute. God looked down at His creation. He looked down at the beauty of His... You know, this world, it's really awesome when you look at it. All the, all the beauty of nature... And, I mean, I know there's some evil and ugliness in it, but the creation is so beautiful, you know. And God looked down at this, and he said, that's not enough. He said, I need to make you. I need to add you into that. God thought enough of you that he would add you into his creation. He said, the world needs one of you, a unique individual. The world needs you. And God created you and put you in it. That, let that thought soak in. He wants you to have peace and a future with hope. And he made that available through Jesus. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Not, let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. We have peace through Jesus Christ. No matter what this world brings, no matter what comes against us, no matter who's mad at us or, or what, <clears throat> who's sick that day or, Who's in the hospital? We have peace knowing that we're at peace through the Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ. That the worst thing this world can do is kill us. 
But yet the best thing this world could do is kill us. Because we've been promoted, we've been sent up to be with the Father. So the thing the world says is the worst thing that can happen to you. Yeah, how many of y'all heard the phrase, well, they can't eat me and they can't kill me. Yeah, maybe it's about your job or something. I know. So what's the worst thing going to happen? They can't kill me. Well, yeah, what if they did kill you? You've been promoted. We have that peace of knowing that we can be with the Father through Jesus Christ. No matter what this world brings against us, our future is secure. Our future is bright. Said old song, our future's so bright, I gotta wear shades. Now that's what the Christian's attitude ought to be. We was talking this morning about some country song that had spiritual meaning. Hey, maybe Tom Petty, they weren't, I think that was Tom Petty, and maybe he had a little spiritual meaning there, you know. That very well could be. Who was? Oh, okay. <clears throat> it's been a long time since the 80s. <laughs> Second thing, God will make your storm calm. Mark 4, 35 through 41 says, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. And when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fear fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and sea obey him? You know the disciples' biggest problems there? You, you know what their biggest problem was in that whole story? It was a lack of faith. It was a lack of faith. They knew who they were in the boat were. They knew their future. They knew who really kept in that ship. They knew who was really in charge. They knew God had it all in control. And whatever the fate of that ship would have been, God would have been in control. If that ship would have went down, or that ship would have never seen a storm, God was in control. And they knew that. Just as we know. When the storms of our life come, we know that God's in control. We know it. We've been taught it. It's been instilled in us since we were young but then we lack that faith when it actually comes we lack that faith just like the disciples they knew all this but they still freaked out they still when we go through a storm when we go through a storm in our life what do we look for we usually look for the tornado that's coming Cheryl <clears throat> Cheryl is scared to death of storms. And I was wondering how I was going to say this this morning without making her mad that she had to leave, so I can do it now. Uh, but she's scared to death of storms. She really is. She, she does not like storms, and she will start freaking out about them. And if there, it, and Lord, she happens to have a friend that works with the news, so she starts texting and calling her back and forth, and they're looking for that rotation. The two of them get to looking for that rotation. They're looking for that tornado in that storm. And I'm like, all you're doing is making yourself miserable. You're looking for something that ain't there. And if it does show up, what are you going to do about it? I mean, you going to get out there and lasso it like they do in the cartoons, or what you going to do? There ain't nothing you can do. And then she gets aggravated at me because I'm like, well, it is what it is. What am I going to do? I'm going to bed. Well, I didn't figure I was along with it. <laughs> you know, and that's what we do in our lives. We start looking. We start, we get in a storm, and we start looking, whoa, something else is coming. I know the tornado's right around the bend. I know that storm's coming. Hunker down and take cover, because I know it's coming. <laughs> and we start thinking about the damage before it's even over. We start thinking about all this stuff. <coughs> you know what the reality is? When we're in a physical storm, all we can do is seek shelter and ride it out. That's the reality. When, you, when the storm comes, you know, one of these unexpected thunder boomers pop up that does have rotations and all, what are you going to do? You're going to seek shelter. 
and ride it out. It's all you really can do. And you know what? The reality is when the, physical, when the spiritual storms come, the storms of your life comes, a lot of times all you can do is seek shelter and ride it out. The question is, where do you seek that shelter at? Jesus is that shelter. We seek refuge in him. We seek shelter in him. Because we know that he can calm that storm. We know he's in control of that storm. Even the winds obey him. So we seek our refuge in him. We seek to him. We turn to him. Instead of turning to everybody else in the world. Hey, you know, sometimes when the storm comes, we turn to we turn to anybody to listen. We will we'll turn to pop psychology. We'll turn to our pastors. We'll turn to this one. We'll turn to that one. And there's nothing wrong with seeking him by, seeking counsel. But we've got to turn to Jesus. It's him that we ultimately got to turn to. If you come to me with a question, with a problem like that, <coughs> my first response have, should be, have you talked to the Lord about it? Because he is ultimately in control. He's that shelter. He's the one that you'll ultimately find refuge in. Third thing, when you get off course, God will straighten your direction. When you're overwhelmed and you get off course, God will straighten your direction. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. A proverb most of us are familiar with. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. You know, he says acknowledge. What, what does he mean by acknowledge? He says in all your ways acknowledge him. Well that word means to seek his wise aid. Seek God's wise, wise counsel. Seek him out in it. Get on your knees. Get in the word. Go to God's word. See what God's got to say about it. <coughs> See what he says about it. Get on your knees. Talk to him about it. Hey, hey sometimes when you're on your knees talking... Something a lot of us neglect to do. Sometimes we need to get on our knees and shut up and listen. And let God speak to us. Just seek Him out. we got to put aside our own desires. You know, that's hard sometimes. Cause too many times we want to tell God what we want out of this situation. Say, God, this is what I want. Now you're going to give it to me. But what we want ain't necessarily what we need. And sometimes God's telling you, no, 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 you ain't getting that. This is what you're getting. This is what you need. Not what you want, but that's what we do. We, we put our own desires over there and we say, God, this is the deal. God said, I ain't doing this deal. Who said I was making a deal with you like that? But that's what we want to do. How many of y'all have been guilty of that other me? And God, you know what? I'll be, <coughs> hey, how about this? You're in trouble. Y'all heard this on TV, it's in the movies. Oh, God, you get me out of this situation, I'll be in church every Sunday. <laughs> and then the next Sunday, well, God, you know I didn't really mean that. You know? That's the way we do it. Though. We, we, <clears throat> we put our own desires up there. Put aside your own desires and seek God. Don't lean on your own understanding. <laughs> Adrian Rogers we, we watched a video of him uh, Monday night in the movie. One of the things he said is, you're not always meant to understand. There's going to be things you don't understand. You're not called to be understanding. You're called to be obedient. Just because we don't understand why we're going through the situation, we don't understand the situation, doesn't mean we're not obedient to God through the situation. He says... <clears throat> Lean not on your own understanding. His ways are wiser than my ways. His thoughts are, are higher than my thoughts. <clears throat> Trust that God has this. When you're going through them things, when things are feeling overwhelming, you trust that God has this. <coughs> you know what it says? He shall direct your path. It don't say he might. It don't say maybe. It says he shall direct your path. He says, if you'll trust in him with all your heart and you'll lean not on your own understanding 
And in all your ways acknowledge him. Seek his counsel. Seek his wisdom. He shall direct your paths. He shall. He'll give you the right path to take if you'll do those things. Another thing to remember when we're feeling overwhelmed is to forgive. To forgive just as Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4, 31, 32 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. You know, many of us hold, say we forgive, but we hold on to, to bitterness in our heart. You don't believe it? How many of y'all say, well... God said forgive. He didn't say to forget. Yet usually the person that says that is still holding on to some of that. They're not truly forgiving. Because God says forgive one another as God forgave you. <clears throat> we, what does God do with your transgression? Your transgressions are not even a memory to God. You understand that? Your transgressions are blotted out. They're gone. Your sins are gone to God. Now you try to do that in your own life. When somebody sins against you and you say you forgive them, try to blot that out. Try to just make the memory go away. We have a hard time with that, don't we? We have a hard time with that. We have that forgiven but not forgotten attitude. And, and you know, I'm not saying you should. The situation should teach you things. They should teach you life lessons. There's no doubt about that. But God's saying forgive as Christ forgave you. That's saying forget, forgive totally. Let it go. Get it. Go on with it. Not even a memory anymore. He says forgive as I forgave you. Forgotten. Locked in a box. Key thrown away and the box is destroyed. That's the kind of forgiveness God is wanting. Just get rid of it. Just get rid of it. But you say, that person doesn't deserve my forgiveness. How many of y'all met a person like that? They don't deserve my forgiveness. They ain't done nothing to get my forgiveness. Newsflash. Neither one of us, none of us, has done anything to deserve God's forgiveness. But he offered it to us anyway. He put it up there for us and gave it to us. That's why he says, as Christ forgave you. We don't deserve his but he gave it anyway. Somebody might not deserve yours, but you give it to them anyway, just as Christ forgave you. <clears throat> Another thing to remember when you're feeling overwhelmed, God accepts you as his own. Hebrews 12, 6, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son and scourges every son whom he receives. You are a child of God. Gloria mentioned it this morning. She is a daughter of the King. And that's a sobering thought, ain't it? That, that's a great thought. To know that you're a child of the king. So when God chastises you, remember it's because he loves you. you know, how many of y'all think back and, and you're kind of you grateful for the whippings that you got, especially when you look at a generation that don't get whippings and all? You know, I, I, at school now, I don't guess they give whippings. Now, I'm here to tell you that Tom Prim can swing a paddle. Because mm -hmm. I have been on the receiving end of it. And I'm thankful for that because it was correction. It was instruction in my life. And, hey, the sting of that paddle has an effect. It makes you remember. You know? <clears throat> when you look at some overprivileged brat, ain't you glad that you were corrected? That you don't act like that? That your parents cared enough about you? That they loved you enough to correct you? To chastise you? I am. I, I really am grateful. You know, I didn't enjoy the whippings. I ain't saying I enjoy the memories of the whippings. But I'm thankful that my parents loved me enough. That my school teachers thought enough of me to chastise me and correct me. God cares about his people. He cares about his children. 
and he wants us to do better. Sometimes he has to chastise us a little bit. Sometimes he has to correct us a little bit. <clears throat> the next time God chastises you, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to lay on the floor and throw a little fit like some little brat in the grocery store? Y'all ever seen one of those? Young and just lay on the floor, throw him a fit. Makes you want to go over there and whip him, not even know who it is. <clears throat> Are you going to take it and accept it for what it is? Say, God, you know, you know what? I was wrong. And I'm going to work on this. And I'm grateful, God, that you love me enough to correct me so that I don't keep going on that path. The final thing. When you're feeling overwhelmed, God is always with you. Always with you. Deuteronomy 31 6. Be strong and of good for courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He is there waiting for you. He is always with you. He is there waiting. Next time you feel like God has left, the next time you feel like God's not there anymore, that he's departed, that he's left the building or whatever, ask yourself this question. Who moved? Because the word of God says God will never leave you nor forsake you. So that tells me you have moved into a place that God can't go with you at. Because he says he'll be right there with you. You're the one that's moved, not him. And you know what's... What's really kind of silly about the whole situation? God makes it so easy for us to draw closer. There's no magic formula or anything. He simply says in James 4, 8, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. It's that simple. God makes it so simple, he makes it like a two-in-one process. He says, you take one step, I'll take one step. So it's like basically every time you take a step, it's like taking two. He says, you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. How's that? He said, I'm not, I'm not going to be out there making you run towards me. He said, you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. If you'll take a step, I'll take a step. He's always there. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Remember that when you're feeling overwhelmed. God ain't left. God ain't. God's still a part of the situation. He's still a part of the equation. <clears throat> it's easy in this world to get overwhelmed. It's easy with all the hustle and bustle of today's activities, you know. <clears throat> we work full-time jobs. We raise families, you know. Both parents work in most modern families. And, you know, sometimes I know in my household, we, we really try to sit down and eat supper together, but sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to even sit down and eat supper. And you know, I remember growing up, that was just part of my family. We sit down and ate supper every night. But we get so overwhelmed and so busy. And life just consumes you and it gets overwhelming. And you know, and eventually it catches up and you stop and you start thinking about all this stuff going on. But God has given us the answer to this stuff. He said, you don't have to feel overwhelmed. He said, when you do, turn to me. I, I'll show you right here. I got hope for you right here. My word is full of hope for you. As Tanel comes up and plays something today, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you need to be at this altar for anything, you come forward today. You come forward and you just talk to God about it a little. You cling to his promises. You cling to the hope that's found in his word. You draw nine to him, he'll draw nine to you. You need to be up here for whatever reason today. You come forward. You draw up. Take that step and God will take that step. <clears throat>